Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. I work as a park ranger in the Deep South. My assistant was a member of a cult, the lone survivor of a mass suicide orchestrated to get their souls free passage onto the nearest UFO. His name is Jay Hardwick, and mine is Jay Salem. To avoid confusion, everyone just calls him Wiki and me Little Jay, even though I despise that nickname and always have. The Little Jay thing is an old and rather worn out joke, as I stand about seven feet tall. My parents were also monstrously tall, and their parents before them too, and so on and so forth, probably all the way back to the time of the Denisovans. Just like Great Danes are inbred for their gargantuan size, Apparently, my family followed a similar policy of foolhardy eugenics. Regardless, I prefer people to just call me Jay. The little thing gets old. Hey, Jay, Hardwick said to me. Does that look normal to you? He pointed across the field where a two-headed black bear stared at us, blinking in bewilderment. It doesn't not look normal to me, just ignore it. Rule number one of this job is to always ignore everything that doesn't immediately threaten your life, and even some of the stuff that does, maybe. I looked down from the bear, but Hardwick was still frowning. He has a hat on. I looked up, and Hardwick was right. One of the bear's two heads had a Herbalife cap on. I frowned. Well, that's not against the law, I said. Bears can wear hats. Yeah, but it's a scam, he said. That's not against the law, I said. Americans have the right to participate in any scam they want. They call it the free market, I think or maybe the First Amendment. I forget the difference. Okay, point taken, but... Hardwick raised his index finger for emphasis. It isn't even sunny out. Why the hat? Hardwick, I feel like you're asking the wrong questions here, I said. Siamese twins, two-headed bears, flying saucers from outer space. These things all happen. The real question is, do I care? I shook my head. You need to learn the ropes of this job if you're going to become a real park ranger like me. Rule number two, do the least work possible all the time and maybe even less than that if you need to. Don't make yourself look too good or people will be expecting you to do things all the time. And that comes back to rule number one, which is to ignore nearly everything strange or weird. I tapped my nose in confidence at him. If you do almost nothing from the start, people will expect nothing of you. Then you have nowhere to go but up. Yeah, but you've been in the same position at the same pay for 10 years, so... He shrugged. Point taken, Hardwick. I just looked back down to the magazine I was reading, some rag about Bigfoot sightings in British Columbia, and how Elvis was just spotted, alive and well in a bathroom in Guatemala somewhere. Hardwick was an average-looking guy, six feet tall with a man bun and pale gray eyes. He had two degrees from Stanford, but decided he would rather work here, for some reason that I had never asked him about. He currently sat in the ranger station looking out the window, still observing the Herbalife bear. As usual, we were understaffed, and weird stuff was happening. Weird stuff seemed to always happen when we were understaffed, almost as if the universe knew we had two people working in a hundred square mile park and could do almost nothing about any of it. Management would try to fix the problem, occasionally hire some new blood, some motivated youngsters who thought they could change the world, or save the environment, or whatever it is kids wanted nowadays. But as soon as they realized just how strange and dangerous the park was, most of them quit. Some of them disappeared, never to be seen or heard from again. The only exception so far was Hardwick, because he said he had seen far weirder things in the UFO cult. I'm not sure I believe him. Nothing could be weirder than Gorham Park. At that moment, Sheriff Ames burst in the door. He was a good old boy from a plantation family, and moreover, he had the strangest and most aesthetically unappealing body I had ever seen. His legs and arms were thin and emaciated, like sticks, but his gut and chest were huge. He looked like a walking barrel with four skin-colored twigs attached. I don't even know how his legs supported his massive gut. 
His watery blue eyes and protuberant nose were a maze of burst capillaries from lifelong alcoholism, and his southern drawl was so thick that even I only picked up about one word out of two that came out of his mouth. Hey, y'all, he said, nodding his head at me and Hardwick. Hardwick turned around to face the newcomer. You ever end up calling the DEP about those meth labs that exploded back there? He pointed a shaky, crooked finger towards the woods. Last week, a meth lab had caught fire and started a small brush fire. Exploded was, in my book, a little bit too strong a word. But then again, I wasn't a law enforcement agent. None of this was too out of the ordinary. Meth labs were found all over the Deep South, and sometimes they caught fire. What was bizarre was that the meth cook had apparently cut off his own feet, hands, and head, then nailed these to random trees in a hundred-foot radius around the burnt-out meth lab. The cops, as usual, ruled this death a suicide. Anything they didn't want to deal with was inevitably ruled a suicide or accident, especially if it involved someone nobody would ever notice was missing. I think all the townies knew it was a lie, but the police force was so underfunded that they had to cut corners somewhere. I respected that and knew it was just a part of life in small-town America. Oh yeah, the Department of Environmental Protection said the whole area is totally foobar, Hardwick said behind me. The sheriff looked at him with his bleary eyes. The environmental guy told me it is going to take at least six weeks to clean the area, I elaborated. Actually, I think they have some people working down there right now. They said the toxic chemicals in the area are off the charts. Apparently, lots of dumping and... I could tell he wasn't listening anymore. His eyes roved around the small ranger's shack where I currently sat and where Hardwick stood by the window. You know what I think the problem is with these kids nowadays? The sheriff asked me. I thought to myself, no, but I bet you are about to tell me. Satanism. There's lots of creepy shit going on around here, and it all boils down to Satanism. These kids have no sense of Jesus Christ, no sense of pride in our country, so they cover themselves in cat blood and smoke meth and do orgies, or even worse, get gay married. No offense if y'all are part of any of that, he said, motioning from me to Hardwick as if I didn't get the insinuation. It is for the dissolution of our once great nation. I'll tell you that right now. Huh, Hardwick said, stroking his goatee. That about summarized my thoughts on it too. By the way, did you ever find out more about that suicide back there? You mean the goddamn guy who cut his feet and hands off with a power saw? The sheriff asked, his eyes widening. Well, we know he was the one cooking that crap. I kind of assumed that, I said, but the sheriff cut me off. Second, we found traces of some weird stuff in his meth. Guess it isn't even meth, technically, though a lot of it is. But some of it was crap we ain't never seen around here before. Acetyl alpha methcathinone this and bromo birdie fly that, and a bunch of other bizarre hallucinogens and bath salts that would send anyone over the edge. Pronto. I'm guessing we are going to be seeing a lot more psychotic drug breakdowns around this here town before the week's end. Assuming that shit got out into the community, the sheriff shrugged it up at the tickly at me. Nothing I can do about it, anyway. You just gotta carry a 45 for protection. A 22 do don't do nothing to those nut jobs on bath salts. They laugh it off like it's some sort of a paintball gun. He raised his hand to the ceiling. Word to my mother, I've seen it happen. So you think he was sampling his own product, went insane on it and somehow cut himself up like that with a bandsaw? I asked, genuinely curious as to how the sheriff would react. He leaned close to me, a subtle smell of rum or some other sweet spirit on his breath wafting over me, and whispered, as if he were confiding the answer to the mystery of life, the universe, and everything else to me. Instead, he told me the most obvious statement I had heard all week. I don't think that was a suicide boy, he said, shrugging his eyebrows up and down as he talked. Sure, sure, a man could cut off his feet easily enough with a bandsaw, maybe the head too, but the hands? How in God's green earth could he get the hands? I shrugged my eyebrows back at him in what I hoped was a non-threatening, brotherly gesture. Geez, I never thought that maybe he was murdered, I said, hoping I sounded serious. I mean, what if he jerry-rigged the bandsaw to keep running, like, 
put a heavy band around the trigger and then fell into it with both his hands after getting his feet, then saved his head for last. Maybe someone hopped up on enough drugs could ignore the pain long enough to get through that. Sheriff Ames shook his bulldog-like face, loose skin rippling as he looked down at the well-worn wooden counter between us. Nah, not a sign of jerry-rigging or anything else in the area. CSI would have definitely found it by now, he said. I had my doubts, but I kept them to myself. According to my research, law enforcement investigative techniques actually have a long history of mistakes and overall negligence, and it sent countless innocent people to prison, Hardwick said behind us, perking up like he always did when rambling about a subject he knew. And he knew about nearly everything. He read a book a day, seemed to remember everything, and didn't find any subject too boring to study. The only area of expertise where they don't have an insanely high error rate is DNA testing, but the rest? Bite mark evidence and hair sampling and even fingerprinting? Their error rate is so high that it puts thousands of innocents into prison alone and Sheriff cut him off, lifting his hand up as if he were flicking away a housefly. Look, boys, I ain't come here to talk about studies. I don't care, honest. It ain't my job and I trust my men. I actually need a favor from you, he said, looking mainly at me with a small glance towards Hardwick, as if sizing him up. Seeming satisfied with what he saw, he continued. Do you remember where those Satanists killed that little girl? The sheriff asked. I nodded solemnly. I need you to go back there and see if someone dropped something. Something small, maybe just a bracelet or a necklace. We got a tip that certain undesirables are revisiting the site. I wondered who would have given him the tip, or how they could have known who was visiting what miles in the woods. And I certainly didn't know about any Satanists. From what I had seen, that little girl had been savagely killed by a monster not a human being, and no one had ever been caught for the crime. Yet somehow the local media had known it was Satanists as if by magic. No one ever wanted to acknowledge that there were demons and monsters in the park, and they would attribute it to anything they could as long as they could avoid it. Sure, Sheriff, I said, nodding. Hardwick and I have to go on patrols today anyway. We can stop by the area. After nodding and shaking my hand, Sheriff Ames took off in his car leaving just Hardwick and I alone in the ranger station. I turned and noticed the two-headed bear had gone. He had probably left before Ames even got there. At that moment, the phone rang. Hardwick picked it up, tilting his head slightly. Hello, ranger station. How may I help you? He said quickly. He pulled the phone away from his ear slightly, grimacing, then handed it to me. It's for you. I took it begrudgingly, holding it at arm's length as if it was a poisonous snake getting ready to strike, but after taking a deep breath, I put it to my ear. This is the head ranger on duty, how can I help you? I will eat your soul, a deep demonic voice said, coming through the phone at an amazingly loud, eardrum-shattering volume. I will kill everyone you love in front of you and rip off your skin. I will burn your town to the ground. For I am the destroyer of stars, the devourer of worlds, and the bringer of the dead lights. You will all tremble before me. Before I am done with you, you will... Sir, are you sure you have the right number? I asked. I mainly just clean up the trails around here. You dare interrupt me? The voice screamed, making my right ear ring. I winced, pulling the phone farther away. Listen to me, maggot, and listen closely. If you go to the spot where the girl's sacrifice was performed, you will die. Stay far away. If you want to extend your puny life by even a single minute, you will avoid the areas we have deemed holy ground. Remember this, or today will be a day of endless torment and pain for you. With that, the phone call ended. The dial tone seemed so quiet and serene by comparison that I forgot to hang it up. What was that about? Hardwick asked, curious. Wrong number, I said, walking the phone back to the cradle. All right, let's get this over with. We need to go to the spot where that little girl died and see if we can't help somehow. I sighed. I guess we better do it while there's still daylight, as I really don't want to be trapped out there after dark. We grabbed some protein bars, water, and a couple walking sticks, and headed out. As we got a few miles out on the packed dirt trail, 
mostly walking in silence and enjoying the scenery and the smell of pines and maple, Hardwick lit up a joint. Hardwick, you should not be smoking that shit on the job, I said. In fact, you shouldn't be smoking it at all. It makes you stupid, and it smells like a skunk ate another skunk then shit him out. Hardwick shrugged, ignoring my point. I don't get how the sheriff knew someone was visiting the site, Hardwick said, or why he couldn't just go himself or send one of his cop buddies to do it. Why come to us? None of this makes any sense. I have a feeling that if Sheriff Ames tried to hike five miles off the beaten path, up and down all these hills, his heart would explode and that would just give us more paperwork to do. Besides, I said, stopping to move a large branch off the trail, we need to clean the paths up anyway. I haven't been out this way in over a month. As I dragged the immensely heavy oak branch towards a deep pile of brush, ten paces or so off the trail, I saw a long arm begin to snake out from behind a tree and approach Hardwick. It looked like an optical illusion at first, because the tree was only a couple feet wide, but the arm that came out looked like it went on forever. By the time I noticed it, literally over ten feet of white, bony arm had extended and it was still coming out, like a massive cobra uncoiling from a tiny basket at the tune of some invisible snake charmer. Um, Hardwick, I said, my mouth suddenly going dry. I could only point silently while the blood drained from my face as the arm came to within inches of his shoulder. He raised one eyebrow at me as he took another inhalation off the joint, and then all hell broke loose. The arm grabbed him with an iron vise-like grip and dragged him out of view so fast that he looked like nothing more than a hardwick-sized blur to me. Behind me, the same voice I had heard on the phone began to speak. You couldn't wait to meet death, to die screaming and watch your friend be torn apart limb from limb. The demonic voice said, incredibly deep and resonant. I felt every word shake my bones as it spoke. I turned and saw one of the most hideously deformed creatures I could ever imagine. It stood over fifteen feet tall, with the same endless bony arms as the other one that had come from behind the tree. It was entirely naked, bone white, emaciated and nightmarish looking in every sense of the word. Its eyes looked like pure white cataracts, with a thin bluish film near the pupil. Its skin clung so tightly to its body that I could see every rib and bone that composed it. Its nose looked like the thin slit nose of a snake, and its ears were missing. But its smile was the most disturbing part. It had a grin that looked far too wide for its face, showing off dozens of bleeding, sharp little teeth. Small rivulets of blood ran down from its mouth, leaving pink streaks over the bottom portion of its entire face. From behind me I heard Hardwick shout, then a gunshot. I turned and saw Hardwick holding a pistol, another creature like the one before me holding him ten feet off the ground. Its other long arm snaked out and whipped the gun out of Hardwick's hand, sending it flying far away into the brush, and I knew we were doomed. Hardwick always carried a small twenty-two on him for protection, but I had nothing more deadly than a Swiss Army knife on me. Then, just as all hope left me, I heard a roar from behind me and a scream of pain from the creature that had spoken to me. Turning quickly, I saw the two-headed bear bound out of the woods and rip into the monster's thin, immensely long leg. With a quick snapping sound, one of the heads snapped its femur, sending a bloody spike of bone out through the monster's flesh. I heard Hardwick fall with a grunt as the other creature dropped him and began to draw forward, planning on attacking the bear. But with all of its attention on the main threat, it didn't see me as I ran at him from the side, raising my walking stick and whacking it across the head as hard as I could. I heard a crack of bone, and then the creature looked unsteady, stumbling along for a few steps before falling. The two-headed bear quickly rushed forward and went for its throat. Hardwick, run, I said, pulling him up and heading back to the ranger station. I don't think either of us have ever sprinted three or four miles so fast before in our lives. I thought at multiple points I might pass out. But we made it back to the station in record time, panting heavily and chugging water after water before slumping down against the wall. We looked at each other. Did we just get saved by that Herbalife bear? he asked me. I nodded, smiling. I think we owe that two-headed bugger quite a bit, I said. Hell, I'll buy it a whole steak dinner with mashed potatoes and apple crisp for dessert. He deserves it. Why do you think he saved us? I could only shake my head, having no answer. 
Things continued to get weirder after that and I know at least one of those monsters and two-headed bear survived, because I would run into them later that week. I wasn't going to give up on being a park ranger just because of a couple near-death experiences after all. This was my place, and I felt like I belonged to it, just like I hoped it belonged to me in some way. Later on, I would immensely regret not reaching the site of that girl's murder, as the sheriff had been right. There was a necklace there, and it would cause a heap of trouble later on. But that's a story for next time. After we had returned to the ranger's station, I had a couple shots to calm my nerves. Looking down, I realized I had been spattered in the blue-black blood of the creature from the forest. Tiny droplets had dried on my arms, chest, and face, and as I licked my lips I realized I just ate a little of the blood too. I gagged for a second, furiously wiping at my mouth and spitting on the floor. Wiki seemed mostly unaffected by what had just happened. He was a teetotaler, avoiding all alcohol but smoking cannabis, and occasionally even taking psychedelics. Whenever I drank, he always told me, alcohol rots your brain and kills your liver, though I doubted any of that would matter if the things in this park killed me first. I was looking into my empty shot glass with trembling hands when Sheriff Ames came into the ranger station, flanked by two agents in black suits and sunglasses. Back already? I asked him. He didn't respond. Care for a drink? He looked at the bottle of Sky Vodka, seemed to consider, then glanced at the agents next to him and shook his head no. Son, did you find anything out there? He asked in a fatherly tone, his southern drawl receding a bit now that he apparently had company from one federal agency or another. We had a bit of a problem, I said. Hardwick nodded. Wicky Little Jay, the sheriff said, turning to Hardwick. Did you actually search the area? I need to know. We had a tip that someone involved dropped a critical piece of evidence. You don't understand, Sheriff, Hardwick said. We were attacked. I tried motioning to him subtly with my eyes, but I think I just made a weird face, one that failed to communicate anything. I was trying to tell him without words that spouting off about 15-foot-tall emaciated monsters with grins as wide as basketballs would probably be a bad idea and make us look totally insane to boot. It didn't work. I swear, we were less than a mile away from the sighty where the little girl's body was found, when something just grabbed me from out of nowhere. It was an arm, but not human. The arm must have been 12 feet long. It was like something out of an H.P. Lovecraft story. The thing it was attached to, words cannot describe how horrible it looked. Its eyes were like filmy blue cataracts. Its grin made the Cheshire cats look like nothing. Its fingers were bony claws and blood dribbled down its mouth constantly, as if it was chewing on its own tongue. And the smell. It smelled like burning metal, like failing car brakes combined with cooking onions, with a little bit of rotting meat thrown in for good measure. Hardwick stopped, taking a deep breath, then looked from Sheriff Ames to the two agents. They all stared at him, deadpan. Son, the sheriff said, you didn't take any drugs today, did you? In fact, Hardwick had smoked a joint, but I wasn't about to say that. They already were looking at us like we were a danger, raging psychotics who had somehow escaped from the loony bin and stolen a couple ranger uniforms. One of the agents was writing in a notepad, talking softly to himself, saying things like, seeing monsters, rotting onions, bony dribble. Wiki, I said quietly, please let me do the talking. Hardwick frowned but nodded. Sheriff, what he means is, I think we were attacked by two people wearing masks. It all happened very fast, but they were tall, he's right about that. Very long arms. It must have been some sort of costume or makeup job, perhaps two gang members trying to cover their identities with some cheap Halloween costume. Of course, all of that was total bullshit. I knew those two things were not human, and they definitely had no masks but would it do any good to tell the truth in this situation? At best, it would be laughed off, and at worst, the police would think us untrustworthy and fail to take us seriously in the future. Okay, okay, Sheriff Ames said thoughtfully, reconsidering his pitch. I believe you, Ranger. With this, he gently put a hand on my shoulder, as if calming down a child having a temper tantrum. These are Agents Roe and Jimenez, from the FBI. 
They are investigating similar cases across the U.S., where children were taken and apparently used in some kind of sacrifice. That little girl had her heart taken out, and that wasn't the only internal organ missing. Apparently, there is a pattern of these bizarre cases with the organs removed, and because it crosses state lines, the FBI is adding its resources to ours so we can hopefully catch the bastards who are doing this. Sheriff Ames shook his bulldog-like face ruefully, looking down at the ground. Ranger Salem, Agent Rowe said, stepping forward, his face lacking any discernible emotion. Have you by any chance found any jewelry abandoned on the paths around the park? I know it is a long shot, but at other crime scenes, there was always a piece of jewelry left days or weeks after the murder had taken place. As if the suspect came back and planted it, maybe in an attempt to send some kind of message to law enforcement. The jewelry never belongs to the murder victim or anyone known to the victim. In fact, a lot of it appears connected to voodoo or other types of witchcraft, generally with obsidian carvings. Does any of this ring a bell? I shook my head. I'm sorry, no, I said, we can try to go back to the scene. Like hell we will, Hardwick cried, but I gave him a look that shushed him. But we would like additional protection. Of course we can guide you both there, but we were just attacked a couple hours ago, and I believe the suspects are still roaming the trails. I'm not going back there, Hardwick muttered silently. No fucking way. I do not get paid enough to die at the hands of some cheap slender man knockoff. I smiled slightly at this. Actually, now that we have federal resources involved in this case, we don't really need you to physically return to the site, Agent Rowe said. But if you could draw us a map of the trails, including the less traveled ones and their relation to the murder site, it would help us. I nodded and got a piece of paper. While I am no Da Vinci, I did a passable job of connecting the spider web of trails and labeling them. With that, the two agents left, heading behind the ranger station towards the first of the trails that would lead deep into the woods. Boy oh boy, Sheriff Ames said, pouring himself a shot of vodka now that his federal babysitters were gone. This is going to be a clusterfuck. Anytime the feds step in, they make things so much worse. In my experience, anyway. He took the shot back like a pro, not even grimacing as the burning liquid went down. Without hesitation, he poured himself another one and knocked that back as well. Well, I'm off to the station. Your job is to help those agents in any way they see fit. If they tell you to jump, ask how high. The quicker we get this mess sorted out, the quicker they can leave. With that word of advice, he tipped his hat to me and headed back to his car. As I heard him take off, his muffler sounding as if it was about to fall off as he peeled away. An old, broken, rust bucket of a truck pulled in. It was a local that I knew well, a rancher named Bud Beacon with more kids than teeth, and a sickly yellow cast to his skin. He had a Budweiser hat on, and a grease-stained plaid shirt with multiple missing buttons on it. He stumbled in, and he did not look healthy. He had never looked healthy, but now he really didn't look healthy. Due to budget cuts, the ranger station also doubled as a small convenience store to try to bring extra income into the park. We sold odds and ends, like umbrellas, trail maps, hats, hiking shoes, and some food and drink. Because there were no other stores around for miles, the locals often came here despite our high markup and suspiciously missing expiration date labels on many of the items. Bud Beacon was one of our most regular customers. Good afternoon, bud, I said, nodding my head at him. He acted disoriented, as if he didn't even know where he was, and kept stumbling into the racks and walls, knocking some sunglasses to the ground before kicking over an umbrella stand. Uh, he said, a slight puddle of drool coming out of his mouth. Do you sell, you know? He pantomimed unbuckling a bra and sucking an imaginary nipple. I had no idea what he was talking about. I think we may be out of that right now, but maybe check Walmart or Costco, I said convivially, giving him a reassuring smile. His eyes rolled back and forth, never focusing on me for a second. Bud, are you feeling okay? You look a little under the weather. That was the understatement of the century. He looked like he might collapse and have a seizure at any moment. They took my kid, he said, and with horror I realized that he had a massive slice on the back of his skull. 
It looked as if someone had sent a throwing knife into the back of his head. I hadn't seen it before since he was facing me, but he put his head down and I saw the back of his shirt was totally covered in blood. Wiki, I said. I think we have a problem. Hardwick looked up from his phone, his mouth opening in astonishment as he saw all the blood on Bud's back and head. He approached him cautiously and began speaking like someone talking to a rabid dog, whose testicles were caught on a piece of razor wire, very softly and slowly. Oh, hey, buddy, he said, putting his hands out, palms up. What happened to you? Do you need us to call someone? Of course he needs us to call someone, I shouted at Hardwick. His freaking skull is split open. But Bud grabbed my hand in a vice-like grip and brought it to his lips, then began whispering. No, don't worry, Ike, about me. My boy is in the woods where he's still alive. Kidnapped, he said, his words becoming increasingly disjointed and drawn out before he lost consciousness, toppling backwards onto the well-worn hardwood floor. A small puddle of blood began to pool around his head as his glassy eyes stared up at the ceiling, his face taking on an animalistic and terrified cast as he swam between consciousness and unconsciousness. Wiki, call the police, I said, breathing hard and looking around quickly. I saw nothing out of any of the windows to alert me to imminent danger, but I had a feeling of being watched. The state police, I amended, thinking of Sheriff Ames' alcoholic bulldog eyes. The town cops had never been of much use around here, except at covering up crimes and displaying a level of incompetence I could only characterize as admirable. I mean, I thought I did the least amount of effort required in my job, but locals like Sheriff Ames really put me to shame on so many levels. Hardwick was already one step ahead of him, and I heard him murmuring to the dispatcher behind me. I stopped and wondered, how had Bud driven here with such extensive head trauma? He was barely aware and conscious enough to formulate a sentence, less likely to drive a car through the poorly maintained and pothole-ridden roads of our dilapidated southern town. I walked around the desk and peered out the front door. I saw he had totally demolished the ranger station mailbox a couple hundred feet away, where the dirt road met pavement, and that his truck had four flat tires. Some of the tires were so badly worn away that he had apparently driven on the broken, rusty rims for the last part of his journey. The rotors and rims were all shot to shit, and the car would definitely need to be towed out of here. Taking a deep breath, I walked out the door and decided to have a look around. Maybe his son was out here, somewhere. I began to circle the log cabin facade of the station, going behind the dumpsters, when I saw a familiar face, or rather two familiar faces. It was the two-headed bear who had saved my and Hardwick's lives earlier in the day. He stared at me with a calm, impassive intelligence that I had never seen on any animal's face before, then started speaking. Except his mouth wasn't moving. It was like he was speaking directly into my head, bypassing the auditory facilities entirely. Do not be scared, Jay, the one on the right said, nodding his head and baring his teeth in a simultaneously friendly and terrifying gesture. For once, I did not have to look down at the person, or in this case, bear person, who conversed with me. Even though I stood around seven feet tall, the bear stood only an inch or two less than that, his front paws at his sides in a very human-looking stance. My name is Rolf. He ceased speaking, and the one on the left who still had his Herbalife hat on, continued, and my name is Grolf. They had two separate voices. Rolf's voice was considerably deeper and slower, while Grolf spoke quickly in a more excitable and high-pitched cadence. We have been watching you for a long time, Rolf continued. You have potential, and I believe you are one of the few things keeping the evil in these woods contained. If it were not for you, it would spill out onto the world and all would be lost. Are you sure you have the right guy? I asked aloud, looking between the two heads. I mean, I've had the same job since high school. I have like zero friends, except maybe Wiki, but he's kind of forced to be here with me. So maybe that doesn't even count. I can't even get a credit card and two of my toes are fused together. None of that strikes me as hero of the century. Kind of stats. I paused for a moment, then continued. I do still have all my teeth, though. I guess that's fairly unusual for this town. Grolf shook his head, 
a bemused expression crossing his intelligent, furry face. Do not underestimate yourself, he said. You are told by your society that unless you have many friends, constant beautiful women and ten whole toes, then you are a failure. But you have something much more valuable inside of you. He pointed to my heart with his right front paw. You have kutzpah, grit, the ability to run into a situation even when the odds are clearly stacked against you. You have no idea how rare that is in your species. Did you not put your life on the line just to find a necklace that could solve a little girl's death earlier today? Oh, I think you're confused, I said. That's just because I'm stupid. I don't really worry about death when... Enough, Rolf said with an audible low growl emanating from his black lips, silencing me instantly. We have no time for frivolous arguments. You are the one we need to save this forest, and that's that. If you want to stop this evil from flowing out into your town, your state, and eventually your whole world, you will listen to what we have to say. Time is short. Uh, okay, I said, nodding. A child has been taken from the litter of the man you call Bud, Gralf continued. This child like you is not normal. He is special. He is deeply autistic, but within his mind he is more powerful than the greatest saint or magician your kind can imagine. You must save his life. If he dies, all will be lost. The Tall Ones plan to bring him to the sacrificial grounds by tonight, to the same spot where the girl's body was found. You must save him at any cost. I nodded. We will give you a seal that will allow you to pass through the woodlands at night, unmolested by any of the forest guardians, Gralf said, pulling a small vial from his back somewhere. I really don't know where it came from, because it wasn't like he had any pockets or clothes or anything else that could possibly hold a vial. On second thought, I didn't want to think of where he may have pulled it out from. The two-headed bear began to do a slow, rhythmic dance, moving one foot, then the other, then raising his paws to the sky and looking up with his two heads. He opened the elixir with his teeth and poured it out onto his hand. He then began to shake his furry butt as he moved forward in a kind of dance-like motion, before wiping it on my forehead. The elixir, I mean, not his butt. The elixir was cold and smelt like licorice, but it dried quickly, leaving no trace on my skin. Now I must go, but I will see you again. Take care and try not to die. Okay, I said. I'll do my best, as always, not to die. No promises, though. I went back into the ranger station and Bud Beacon was gone. Wiki was sitting behind the counter, smoking a cigarette and looking at his hands. Wiki, I yelled. What happened? Where's Bud? He looked up suddenly, a confused frown creasing his face. Then he looked down on the floor where Bud was lying, then back up at me, then around the entire ranger station. Then he shrugged. Are you serious right now? I asked. How did you lose track of an unconscious man who was just bludgeoned in the head and was bleeding all over the place? Well, in my defense, he said calmly, I wasn't actually paying attention. I rolled my eyes at this. Just then, one of the agents came running into the ranger station, his suit torn, a nasty gash across his forehead, dripping blood into his eyes. It was Agent Rowe. There was no sign of Agent Jimenez, which I took as an extremely bad sign. Agent Rowe had his pistol out and was breathing at an alarming fast rate. His pupils were dilated, his eyes wide and roving around and he looked like he was overall not having a good day. Lock the doors, he screamed. Do you have any more weapons in here? Move, goddammit. I calmly walked behind him and engaged the deadbolt on the front door. Wiki took another drag of his cigarette, calmly looking the agent up and down. So, Wiki asked, how did it go? How'd it go? How'd it go? He screamed back at him. My partner is dead and I barely got away. They ripped his goddamned arms off his torso and flung them at me like some, some kind of arm-shaped boomerang. His metaphor game was not up to par, but I wasn't going to criticize, as I felt he was in a very trigger-happy mood. Okay, okay, I said comfortingly. We will go check it out. Wiki looked at me like I was insane. Ah, no, we most certainly will not check it out, he said to me. Well, we have to at least find Bud, I said. You're the one who let him get away, after all. All you had to do was watch over a bloody, unconscious man, and you failed at that. 
I know I talk about setting the bar low, but I shook my head in disappointment. That blows even me out of the water. After a minute of discussion, the FBI agent gave us one of his guns. He apparently had an ankle holster with a judge attached as a last resort. Not the kind of judge that sentences you to 30 days for urinating in the local fountain downtown, but rather a squat kind of pistol that shoots shotgun slugs. It felt heavy in my hand and looked totally badass. The FBI agent had another pistol of 45, but he wasn't going to part ways with it under any circumstances. Wiki agreed to come with me for a little while at least. We moved the barricade out in front of the door, and after heaving a deep sigh, I stepped outside. Wiki stayed behind me, his little .22 held out in his hand, now reloaded with spare bullets from the ranger station. I had a lot more faith in the stopping power of the judge than some little .22, however. As I stepped away from the building, I realized something was monumentally wrong. The entire forest sounded as silent as the grave. Somehow it also looked darker, and there was a smell in the air like rotting meat mixed with burning plastic. The smell was so pervasive that it felt thick, like it had its own weight. I felt it on my tongue, my nose, and most of all, my eyes, which immediately began to water. Oh my God, Wiki yelled loudly. What is that smell? I turned around to shush him, but as I did, I saw what the origin of the smell was and immediately froze. The first thing I saw was Bud Beacon floating in the air in front of me. His eyes rolled back in his head, dried blood caked around his hair and face and staining his shirt. Behind him, I saw a vision out of a nightmare. The man, if it was a man, was hunched over. It looked like he had been stitched together out of dozens of bodies. The skull was half eaten away by writhing maggots, showing the grinning teeth and jawbone underneath, some tendrils of black flesh and liquefying goo still holding on against all odds. It looked like someone had stitched four arms to a gigantic torso, which now clenched and unclenched their blackened fingers in unison, the blue cyanotic hues of oxygen deprivation trailing streaks all the way up to his shoulders. He had two immensely long legs, twice the height of a normal human leg, which made him stand taller than me, at least eight feet tall, and towering over the floating form of Bud Beacon in front of him. In the center of his decaying face stood a single massive eye, bloody teardrops running out of it as it constantly looked right, left, up, down, and in all directions. He opened his mouth to speak, and as the words came out, so did a fresh wave of the nauseating smell. A favor for a favor, a life for a life, he said in a voice that sounded like thousands of voices all mixed together, rising and falling in tone randomly as he spoke. You give up and go home, and I will let you and your friend live. This man and his offspring are all mine. He gave them to me. The creature sent out a long forked tongue and licked the maggots off its decomposing lips. I raised the judge, pointing it at his center mass, but I couldn't get a good shot with Bud floating in between us. How about you leave right now? I asked in return, my voice trembling, and I might let you live. His grin widened. From the forest to the right of us, I heard the sound of loud rustling. The son of Bud Beacon appeared, his eyes wide and tear-streaked. Dad? He yelled, seeing his father floating and catatonic. Dad, what are you doing? The distraction was all I needed. I sprinted a few feet to my left, giving me a clear shot without risking the life of Bud, and began firing. The shotgun shells opened up large exit wounds all over the creature's torso, sending out sprays of maggots and rotting meat. But just as soon as they opened, a writhing mass of maggots would begin to stitch the flesh back together. In all the excitement of the gunshots, I didn't realize Bud Beacon had fallen to the ground until I saw him sprawled out there, his eyes closed now, looking as if he were asleep. I continued shooting the creature as it ran at the boy until I ran out of ammo, but it did no good. The maggots just restitched its skin together as soon as the bullet exited. So I watched with horror as its four long arms wrapped around the crying child and they disappeared into the forest. I turned to Wiki, who looked fairly calm and placid despite all that had occurred. Well, I said, now we really have to go after them. His eyes widened. You want to go after an unkillable and gag-inducing eldritch deity? What do you plan to subdue him with, good manners? 
I shook my head. There's an innocent child involved, Wiki, and now we know he is alive. We can't just let him be sacrificed. He groaned. I hope you at least have a plan, he said to me as we began trekking towards the forest. Not at all, I replied. We had just seen Bud Beacon's child taken away by a monster who looked as if he had been stitched together by Dr. Frankenstein himself. I knew the kid's name, Smitty. I had seen him around town many times but never spoken with him. He was autistic, only talked rarely and always had a thousand-yard stare. I knew from Bud Beacon taking him to the ranger station that Smitty had a lot of weird obsessions about food. He would only eat food or drink drinks that were white or clear, so he ate a lot of rice, pasta, milk, and other staples, and drank a lot of water. Any food or drink that had any color other than white or transparency to it disgusted him to no end. If someone tried to give him some, he would close his mouth, turn his head away, and refuse to speak to that person for the rest of the day. So, Wiki said from my left, are we just going to run into the woods and shoot anything that moves? I don't really have any better ideas, I admitted. Maybe that two-headed bear will come back and save us. I wish I could have talked to him more. He seems to be the only one who really knows what's going on around here. I really wouldn't count on him bailing us out, Wiki said. He must be getting sick of us. I only shrugged. Well, as you know, my goal is to live forever, I said sarcastically. So far, so good. If I've made it this far, why not just keep going? Everything always seems to work out in the end. Wiki pulled a joint out of his pocket, lighting it and taking a deep hit. The sun was rapidly setting, the forest gaining an eerie, shadowy look that made it hard to see very far down the trail. And by the way, I continued, the bear is not a he, it is a they and their names are Grolf and Rolf, they told me. Then a horrendous smell started to waft over to us. It wasn't the smell of all the dank weed Wiki was smoking either. This smell was so strong that it immediately overpowered the smell of the cannabis, and to my terror it was a smell I recognized, the smell of burning metal combined with rotting meat. It was the smell of the creatures with the long arms and pale white flesh who had attacked us earlier. Um, Wiki, I began to say, but he threw the half-smoked joint casually in the brush and just nodded. Yeah, I know, bud, he said calmly, his eyes red and slightly squinted as he looked around a big shit-eating grin on his face. Looking at him, you would think we were at an amusement park rather than a cursed forest. They're definitely back. We're being watched. But nothing came out of the brush at us. I could smell the monstrosities, but it appeared the mark from the two-headed bear really worked. I was passing through without being attacked by the monsters of the forest. I had a feeling the bear's mark wouldn't work on everything, though. As we hiked further ahead in the dark, Turning on our flashlights, the smell faded further and further behind us. We heard twigs snapping and bushes being pushed aside in the twilight darkness all around us, but we continued on unmolested. The few shots of alcohol I had taken before leaving to calm my nerves had totally worn off, and I felt a rising sense of anxiety building up inside my chest. As we neared the site at the end of the trail, where I had been told there was a sacrificial altar, a new smell began to arise. It was the odor of burning plastic. A monstrous conglomeration of many bodies stepped out from behind an ancient oak tree to my right, blocking the path. I raised my pistol, a model called the Judge that fired shotgun shells. Grolf and Rolf gave me the mark. I demand passage, I yelled, pointing the pistol at its face, where a monstrous single eye flicked back and forth, looking at me, then Wiki, then back at me again. Move aside, beast. Move aside, let us pass, or I'll kill you. I really will. I hoped I sounded a lot braver than I felt. It felt like my voice was trembling, and I could feel my heart racing. I kept the flashlight tucked under my armpit as I took a deep breath in and tried to steady the gun and calm my nerves. Fool! The monster cried in front of me. I am not bound by the laws of this forest. I was created from corpses in a secret location. The mark of the protector bear has no effect on me. I will give you two standing here one last chance. Turn around, never come back here, and I will let you live. For I am Raka, the strong, the unkillable, but the forgiving for those who repent, the monster said, blowing fetid air in our direction out of his reeking mouth as he yelled. The trees shook around us, 
and I heard birds and bats fleeing in droves as leaves fell from the tallest branches, showering the forest. Okay, listen up here, Raka, Wiki said, stepping in front of me. No one tells us where we can go or what we can do, and there's a kid back there we're supposed to bring back. If you're so strong, why do you take mere children? Raka laughed, a deep, gurgling sound that reminded me of slug slime and moldy, rotting leaves on the bottom of a lake. It sounded wet, sickly, phlegmy, and overall, just disturbing. I heard movement behind Raka, and men and women in black robes started to step out, forming a semicircle. Both Wiki and I had our guns pointed at the new arrivals, yet they seemed totally unafraid. Hail Raka the Great, the strong, the unkillable, said a tall blonde woman in the front. The rest of them shouted in unison, Hail! Hey, you guys stole that from the Nazis. Pretty lame losers, Wiki said, laughing. Actually, I think the Nazis stole it from the ancient Romans, I said. You know, the whole Hail Caesar thing. Wiki gave me a sour sideways look, frowning. The cult members and the monster in front of us totally ignored our conversation. The child is ours, Raka said, smiling a grin with far too many teeth. Many of them appeared rotted and blackened, but still sharp and extremely long. I am done being patient. If you take one step forward, I will kill you both. I took one step forward. Raka's single eye widened in surprise as I raised the gun and began shooting at the cult members behind him. I knew from previous experience that shooting Raka did no good, but that was a problem I'd have to deal with later, probably in about 30 seconds. Wiki followed my lead, firing his 22 at the center mass and heads of the cult members. Within seconds, all of them were on the ground, dying or dead, blood soaking into the dried leaves of the forest floor. With a roar, Raka began to rush forwards towards me, and then everything happened very fast. From my right, a loud rustling started and out popped the two-headed beer, Grolf and Rolf. He sprinted out on all fours from a cluster of bushes nearby, slamming into Raka with an amazing speed and sending him flying 20 feet off the trail and directly into the trunk of a huge evergreen tree. The branch went through the heart of Raka, and though the maggot swarmed and tried to re-knit his flesh, he was caught. His feet moved with futility not even touching the ground since he was suspended about five feet off the ground with the impaling branch keeping him stuck. He roared and screamed, but made no progress. Go now, Grolf said in my mind, his psychic voice echoing with a loud clanging feeling throughout my entire consciousness. I winced at the power of this inner voice. The boy has little time left. The altar is just ahead. You are our only hope. Well, that's not good, I muttered to myself. If I was the only hope for saving this forest, maybe this entire town, then they really were in a much shittier position than I had imagined. Wiki and I ran forward, reloading our guns as we went. A few hundred feet ahead, we saw the flickering glow of a bonfire. A round stone table about twenty feet across sat next to it, a thin shirtless boy tied and gagged on the top of it. Around him cult members in black robes chanted, standing in a circle, every eye on the imprisoned boy. Once we were within range, Wiki and I began firing, my judge pistol blowing holes the size of a grapefruit into the chests of many of the cult members. Wiki was also a great shot, and his 22 put tiny bullet holes into the skulls of those nearest the boy, dropping them instantly. The rest of them scattered like cockroaches, the chanting stopping immediately as they ran in all directions into the forest. We took the opportunity to reload, Let's get this kid and get the fuck out of here, Wiki said, and I nodded. The sooner I get out of here, the better, I thought to myself. Taking out a pocket knife, I quickly began to cut the bindings on the boy's hands and feet while Wiki untied the gag around his mouth. The boy had a vacant, blank look in his eyes. I wondered whether he was in shock. Smitty, can you hear me? I asked him loudly. He didn't respond, just staring through me, not making eye contact. Just grab the freaking kid and let's go, Wiki said. Those other things, the ones with the long arms and the pale skin, are probably going to be back soon. You don't really know how long the protection the bear gave you lasts, do you? Uh, no, I said, trying to remember. I knew logically that it didn't last forever, but would it wear off so fast? I figured we would find out on our way back. 
Grabbing Smitty's arm, I pulled him up from the table. He didn't resist, and when I started speed walking back towards the trail, he kept pace with me. Thank you, Smitty said to me silently. I barely heard him, but looked over at him in surprise. He glanced over at me, making eye contact for the barest fractions of a second, then returned his gaze forwards. Hey, little man, you're welcome, I said, smiling. We weren't going to let you die out here. Your dad is waiting for you, too. I didn't tell him his dad was probably waiting for him in the hospital, getting his head stitched up and his skull fractures checked out. But we are in trouble still, Smitty said, pointing to the tree where Raka had been impaled. Looking up, I realized the branch where I had seen him suspended was now broken in half, and there was no sign of the monster except for thick black blood and thousands of squirming maggots on the fractured remainder. Oh shit. Wiki and I both said at the same time, as a rushing shape smelling like burning plastic and rotting meat sprinted out of the woods, grabbing Wiki and disappearing into the pitch blackness. As he was grabbed, Wiki dropped his gun, yelling in surprise. Once he realized what was happening, he started screaming at me. Get out of here, he said. Don't worry about me. Get the kid to safety. I tried running after him, but Raka was far too fast. After a minute, I turned around and went back to the trail, where I saw Smitty patiently waiting. Fuck! I screamed. We have to get him back! Don't worry, Smitty said, his face a blank expression. I can track them. I can track all of them. I see it like points on a map in my... He stopped walking, pointing to his forehead. I was panting, doubled over from sprinting. But we need help. There are too many of them and the mark is wearing off. I see it on you like light being washed away. Your face grows darker and darker as it fades. This was the most I had ever heard Smitty speak, and I was flabbergasted. We will come back, I said, taking Smitty's hand and leading him to safety. We found his father, who had been picked up by a random passerby as he stumbled in the road, his face a mask of blood, his wounds untreated, the brain damage and concussions making him totally unaware of where he was or what was going on by that point. Gurn Tran. I finished telling all of this to my psychiatrist the next morning. He had been prescribing me antidepressants for my crippling depression, and even though Wiki was gone for now, I still had to go to work and keep my appointments. I knew I would get Wiki back eventually. He was too tough and dumb to kill. The psychiatrist nodded at me as I spoke. Do you blame yourself for what happened to your friend, Hardwick? He asked, pushing his glasses up his nose. No, we did what we had to do, I said, not knowing whether I was being totally truthful. Maybe I did blame myself a little bit, but I didn't want to tell this man that. He wrote a few more notes in his notepad. Then his secretary came in. Dr. Forenzo, the pretty brunette said. He looked up. You have a call. It's an emergency. Nodding gravely, he got up. Please excuse me, Jay. I'll be right back, he said leaving the room and closing the door behind him. I got up after a minute, bored, wondering how long this was going to take. I looked at his notepad, laying face down on his brown leather chair and frowned. Flipping it over, I saw he hadn't been taking notes at all. He had simply drawn a picture across the entire front of the notepad. It was a picture of me, crucified to a lamppost, my eyeballs hanging out, a pentagram carved into my chest. Underneath, in tiny, neat block letters, he had written, Kill the traitor. Well, I said, putting the notepad back down, that can't be good. The FBI offered to send me help in finding Wiki. That day, I had a team of agents and dogs with me at the ranger station. Even Sheriff Ames showed up, saying he wanted to help in any way he could. After all, I had risked my life. I had saved the boy, but now another adventure had to begin. I just hoped I would find Wiki in time and that one day... I would end the evil in this forest, once and for all.